Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, the session. I think a good morning to some and a good afternoon to others. My name is Tim Nicholl. I'm a Pro Vice-Chancellor at Liverpool John Moores University. I have special responsibility for the Liverpool Business School and the School of Law, and it's my real pleasure to, um, to facilitate this session this afternoon. Um, we've all had very different experiences over the last year in terms of lockdown. This actually marks today the anniversary of uh, being sent home by my university to work from home. And here I am a year later, having still never got into the university and working from home. Um, what is good is we know we're getting to the end of this, this, this period and we're anticipating what's going to happen afterwards. And this is very much what this session is around. It's around the issue of entrepreneurship, what it's going to feel and look like and be like post-COVID. Um, we know that uh, there's a sense that the world has been paused in a way. We know we're anticipating so much. We know, however, we have been achieving things. But there's an expectation, I think, of a, of a burst of energy will follow, um, that there will be a wave of innovation and that will be something that we'll take into a very different world. And we've got questions about what the change will be, what issues have emerged during lockdown, which we'll then pick up on and will be the, the focus of innovation, new innovation. We've got to consider what risks are there, what opportunities, what strategies we might have to adopt, and um, just how countries might be changed as a result of these activities. Uh, these are the issues we're going to try and face today, and I'm delighted uh, to be joined by a hugely experienced panel that's going to discuss these issues. So um, I'm going to, first of all, therefore, ask my colleagues to introduce themselves. Uh, could I begin uh, with the boxes of their name? So Sherry, could I ask you to introduce yourself first, please? Yeah, so I'm Sherry, and um, I'm really happy to be here today. And I own a company called The Longest Stay. So The Longest Stay is kind of the world's first shoppable hotel platform. So what we do is we partner with hotels, we furnish hotels, of course, they pay us to furnish the hotels, so we're not a charity. Um, and then we allow people, when they stay in the hotel, to purchase um, the products. So if they like the bed or they like the mattress, or they like the light, they can purchase it um, through us and through our online website. Um, that sells designer furniture regardless of the hotels. So it's all about kind of bringing hotel luxury home. And so I founded that concept about 10 years ago, and I'm based in London. And yes, that's that's kind of my, my main gig. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, lovely to see you. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, everyone. We're Daniel here, um, calling in from Switzerland, uh, Zurich. Um, I'm the managing partner and founder of a venture capital firm called uh, Convergence Partners, and we focus on uh, investments into European health technology companies, <laughs> largely medtech and uh, digital health, and um, actively support their internationalization and scale up in the three key healthcare markets, US, uh, Germany, and China, and uh, are basically a yeah, sparing partner of the management teams you know, to find, you know, local, you know, licensing partners, customers, and really accompany the, you know, entire scale up. Okay, thank you very much. And great to see you. Michael, would you like to introduce yourself now? Uh, yes, thank you. A pleasure. My name is Michael Chavish. I am a founder of OmniGrade Universal Crowdsourcing Agency, and we are creating communities of volunteer experts and supporters around uh, different uh, promising companies, organizations, and projects with noble and ambitious goals. And also we are trying to find some creative solutions of the uh, most convenient uh, and most, most complicated and uh, most important business issues and challenges of these companies with the help of imagination and knowledge of these voluntary experts. That's great. Thank you very much. And Shalendra? Yes. Uh, Good evening uh, and good morning to Americans. Uh, my name is Shailendra Goswami. I'm basically an engineer, 1974, and a management graduate uh, from one of the premier institutes in India, 1977. So it is practically 44 years ago. I did my post graduation and 15 years I've spent in industry and last 29 years I've been in business, uh, a business uh, a group uh, called Pushkaraj Group. I'm the chairman and managing director of uh, the company. We basically cater to five or six uh, uh, branches of engineering, um, including uh, information technology. We have four companies. Uh, we have network in uh, 16 uh, countries and 12 cities in India. And uh, we have been catering to more than three to 400 OEM customers in India and uh, serving uh, roughly around 25 to 26 uh, principals from around the world in uh, distributing their products in India. 
I have been uh, actively cont uh, contributing in academics, uh, uh, being uh, on the board of advisory, the academic councils, uh, uh, designing syllabus for engineering and management students. And also I'm a, a speaker, motivational speaker or a speaker on the international platforms like this. Thanks to Frank, uh, he's been uh, associated uh, uh, with me uh, on these uh, kind of assignments. Uh, uh, for the last three, four years, I have been uh, uh, really uh, the, uh, participating in these uh, Horasis uh, conferences, and I enjoy this. I hope uh, we will have a good session here today. Thank you very much indeed. And I think we're looking forward to a very good discussion. So, Shalendra, I wonder if we could begin with you. I think you would like to talk about two areas. One is around top innovation strategies going forward and also about the impact of, uh, of the countries. And I wondered if you could then start, your, start this debate for us, please. Yes. Um, before getting into the, the uh, strategies, I would like to generally uh, get into this COVID business as such. COVID uh, has uh, really created two big issues uh, in the entire world, uh, including uh, our country. And last 12 months, we have been stuck at home, uh, working from home. So uh, what are those two things? Uh, one is lives and second is livelihood. Uh, you try to save lives, uh, the livelihood suffers. You try to save livelihood, the uh, lives uh, suffer. And this has been one of the biggest uh, question uh, which has been uh, uh, in the forefront of uh, most of the industry. And uh, we don't know how to really um, get out of uh, this uh, uh, Cash 22 situation. But then countries have been managing on this. Uh, the vaccines uh, are underway and uh, everywhere uh, people are undergoing the schedules uh, for vaccines and then they're getting their confidences. And uh, naturally, the uh, Americans are not uh, far behind. But then in America, yes, uh, post-pandemic, uh, America 2021 um, uh, has to look at how the country can uh, uh, recover. The, uh, there are four or five uh, issues which are facing America. As far as I look at it, uh, it's a U.S. presidential transition. Uh, is always a time uh, for the country to reflect and reset. Uh, and given once in a century pandemic, uh, this is going to be a very, very tough ask uh, for the new government. There are four issues which are confronting the country and how public and private sector leaders could organize to drive the change on them. The first of them is defeating COVID. Uh, 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 it is reasonable to hope that the first half of the year could be a bridge uh, to the normalcy. Uh, we have had a very bad year worldwide, so uh, was in America. But with the onset of vaccine, I think uh, in the first half of 2021, we should expect some kind of a normalcy. And when many aspects of social and economic life uh, can resume without a fear and excess mortality. The second issue, which is uh, very, very important uh, as far as uh, India is concerned, as far as America is concerned, is uh, to rebuild the economy. Um, uh, for America's leaders, innovators, and change makers, the post-World War II recovery offers valuable lessons. Uh, for encouraging productivity, innovation, social capital creation in a post-COVID-19 future. The third element uh, which has to be looked at uh, is the advanced uh, racial equality and uh, equity. Uh, repairing the freight social fabric in the United States is not a new problem, but it has become uh, increasingly urgent. Um, higher participations uh, in different roles in the economy, a goal that pandemic has set back. Uh, the last one is commit to climate action. The global transition to a low carbon economy is well underway. Uh, in the United States, uh, 23 states have established emission reduction goals and 12 have instituted carbon policies. So naturally, the process is on, and these four objectives which are facing uh, the country are being looked at uh, very, very uh, effectively. And then uh, the last one is going to be the organization for change. To make all this happen, public sector leaders uh, need to move swiftly, decisively, bringing the whole of government to bear across all these four priorities. And even uh, uh, the labor uh, 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 demand, uh, the mix of occupation is going to be another issue which one will have to look at. And uh, it, because of this particular pandemic, I think up to 25% more workers uh, than previously estimated may need to switch uh, occupations. So these are the issues which are being faced uh, by uh, the country uh, post-pandemic. Uh, of course, as we said that the vaccinations are underway, 
executives everywhere are thinking about the critical uh, next months on the pandemic uh, because of these vaccines and uh, now the debate on the vaccines that uh, after the first shot uh, you will have to wait for the second shot and after that also another 20 days uh, before which uh, you can't get your immunity so you will have to bear with all those protocols of uh, uh, covid uh, which we were following for the last 12 months the americans true to their characters uh, naturally will bounce back in no time and will be riding wave to set right the wheels of the economy and life of the citizens the overall world political scenario is very fragile with testing times of relationships amongst countries usa will do their best to ensure the balance across the world and make efforts to restore peace the innovators haven't kept quiet during covid and have continued their work to cope up uh, with the expectations of the country to be uh, it uh, healthcare industry defense or technologies the methodologies and modalities definitely are going to change and uh, these changes uh, uh, would uh, uh, be incorporated in the uh, uh, strategies uh, which are going to come and those five innovative uh, strategies which are going to be there to driving a new age enterprise uh, because of this uh, covid are going to be the change in workplace dynamics working from home and things like that the employees come first the employees are going to get a uh, prominence uh, uh, which earlier was there but relatively it will have to increase and constant in- interaction and engagement with target audience uh, you know uh, the demands have taken a lot of hit uh, and then we cannot assume our customers just like that so your interaction with the customers and the markets have to go up utilizing the new age marketing tools what we are doing uh, digitally we have been reaching uh, far fetched customers uh, globally we have uh, made the world a very very small place and then the these modern tools will have to be used and then naturally when you are using all these online tools you will need to work out the strategies for reviews uh, because you may get a couple of reviews which may be adverse and then you will have to correct uh, uh, or rather take uh, course corrective actions uh, for those uh, uh, feedbacks uh, which are uh, given to you so all in all if we really look at it uh, we have had a bad year but the future is bright and as we say that another 6 months time we should be on the normalcy and then uh, with the onset of vaccine and then uh, its execution uh, properly in priority list i think we should be seeing a better world a new normal uh, like uh, everyone has been saying thank you thank you very much and for sort of setting the scene around those those five points at the end those five issues and i'm sure they'll be picked up in the discussion sherry i wonder could we come to you now and if you could um give your presentation please well mine's a lot different <laughs> I mean I I guess it's about innovating right and and the time that we have and how does it work I can I can probably just share my personal experience a little bit what I did during covid um it's out of the box it's not something you'll hear every day but it's good to just say that you know sometimes these pandemics bring out the best in us and as I said my company the longest stay is about shoppable hotels well right when covid happened hotels you know closed up right so they weren't interested in refurbing they weren't interested in creating new hotels they were interested in surviving and a lot of the private equity companies wanted to go out and buy you know distressed assets you know people that were going into uh liquidation so i couldn't really get the hotel concept you know to move forward when we were in lockdown we were in covid and the e-commerce side of my business as much as you say well that must really take off e-commerce well it does if you have something to sell and the issue we had is that we didn't have stock so we were doing drop shipping and a lot of our suppliers supply chain were were stuck you know they couldn't get the factories to produce there was no longer eight week lead times it was 18 week lead times and So the whole supply chain kind of came to a halt. Um unless you owned your own furniture and you had your own stock, you weren't going to be doing a lot of shipping. So I took a step back and um and I kind of decided to um by accident Hello I think we I think we lost Charlie. I started so. cooking in my kitchen, working 24/7, you know. 
And I used to live in Italy um, in the past. So I used to spend a lot of time cooking when I was in Italy, when I was married. So I started cooking, I started filming, and then it got, you know, great reviews on my little Instagram and uh, people that worked with Electric Telegraph commented and other people. And then I said, well, actually, there's a brand here. Why don't I create a new brand? So I launched a brand called Sexy Single Dish. Okay, so Sexy Single Dish, um, which I made up, is all about um, sourcing produce. So I would go and visit butchers and fishmongers and interesting markets, and I would source interview people about the produce, come back to my kitchen, I would cook, I would film it, and then I would talk about the interior, so the dishes and the glasses, and I might be sitting on my dining table, which you could all then buy through the longest stay. So I would tie, I created a new product range for the longest stay, which was going into the homeware and glasses and dishware collection, which I could sell. So that that kind of compensated, you know, on one side of the, the furniture that I I could at least get into people, you know, buying dishes and glasses. So the show kind of just was piloted on Instagram. I'm proud to say I've actually done 40 shows in one year. It takes me 15 hours to produce one video of Sexy Single Dish. Um, I managed to get a big TV production company behind me, which is called um, Electric Robin, and they're owned by Endermall, which is owned by Banje. They produce Peaky Blinders, for example, and they did the Kadarsians, that kind of thing. And um, and they've backed me. So now I'm in the process of hopefully signing with someone like Netflix. Um, so I'll have a TV series hopefully later this year. And then that, now that we're coming out of lockdown, now hotels all want to refurbish because it's all been stagnant, um, will help my business. Because if I become a personal brand on a show with my show, right, then people will know that the, the person who goes to single dish happens to own the longest stay. So my marketing strategy was built by default during COVID. And you can spend a lot of money on digital marketing, on AdWords, on Facebook, on shopping ads, and you can be out there, you know, price, price, dropping your price and competing with everyone that's selling the same designer brands as yourself. But one way to build your brand is to build your personal brand. And, and now that I have a show coming, I think, you know, I can then do a book and there's other things that can follow. So, so that's how I innovated during COVID. You know, I just fell into something accidentally. I went with my passion. I kind of, you know, just let it develop organically and said, hey, there's a brand here. And I've got a sister brand now to Longest Day. It's like the Longest Day took me almost like five rounds of IVF to develop. <laughs> and, and Sexy Single Dish was like an accidental pregnancy. That's how I compare the two. Right? <laughs> because Longest Day was like 10 years to get, to get this concept where I needed to be. I mean, it's been a slug because we were so early when we came up with the idea in 2013. I was talking about shoppable hotels and designer furniture. And Sexy Single Dish was like accident. You know, I didn't even think it was possible. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, I have this new baby. So, so that's how I innovated. I mean, I can always, you know, talk about, of course, pick up on the trends that were just spoken about. And I can agree with the majority of those. Um, I do think America will rebuild its economy, of course, and and people will work from home more and all those trends. But, you know, e-commerce as a general will, will definitely now have a, has cemented in people's mind that it works. Um, do I think people will go back to shopping in stores? For sure. That will not change. I don't think e-commerce is like, oh, my God, everyone's got to do e-commerce now. Old habits will come back. Um, but, you know, I think as we go ahead to the next phase of rebuilding our, our businesses and getting them, you know, kind of steaming ahead, there's always ways in which you can reinvent yourself that, you know, you just have to kind of go with the flow and see where you fall. And all of a sudden, I'm quite happy I fell back into cooking and creating a sexy single dish brand. So. Great. Look, thank you very much. That's a really inspiring story of adaptation innovation. And I, I think we'll come back and, and pick up some of those points. Uh, so thank you for that. Mikhail, would you like to uh, take the microphone now, please? Uh, yes, thank you. And um, well, I'd like to uh, talk about risks and opportunities because I think the pandemic has changed the perception of risks and opportunities and risks and opportunities both are very, very important in entrepreneurship. So I will start with the risks. Uh, I think that uh, today is 
very important to detect hidden risk because the pandemic was very, very hidden risk even one year and a half ago. Uh, almost nobody uh, uh, thought about pandemic and now we can realize that maybe it's not the last pandemic and in two or three or five years it will be another pandemic maybe not coronavirus pandemic pandemic caused by another virus not by virus or maybe it will, it will be technological disaster or risks uh, uh, linked with climate change or whatever but uh, risk management is uh, n- not the business of risk managers anymore it is the business of all entrepreneurs and everybody need to think about it It's my first point. And my second point is that procrastination is not a tool to decrease the risk anymore. So uh, there's uh, tactics not to do. Uh, uh, anything is not the best way to uh, fight with the risks. You need to do something. You need to um, uh, develop an action plan in any situation. And... Uh, Uh, I, I, so my, my first conclusion is that uh, uh, the risk in, in the new normal um, will be much higher than one year or two years or three years ago, but uh, uh, high risks uh, mean also high opportunities. And uh, I think that one of the most important changes is that there will be no promising industries and no non-promising industries anymore. So in any industry, you can find an opportunity to develop this industry, uh, to become one of the leading company in the world, to become global champion. So before the pandemic, if you're in IT industry, if you're in biotech, if you're in ed tech, it means that you belong to very promising industry. Uh, if you're a shoemaker or whatever, it's not very promising industry. Today, you can find great opportunities in any industry, in any company. Just for instance, if you take tourist uh, industry, is it promising uh, or not? Uh, maybe traditional uh, tourism is not promising anymore, at least for some period of time. But <laughs> tourism is becoming more and more promising. So there much more risk and much more opportunities. And my last point uh, is about crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is my passion for the last three years. I spent uh, uh, 25 years before in receivables finance industry. So crowdsourcing is very new uh, field of activity for me. And I was a professional in receivables finance. And one of my conclusions is that professionalism is not a, a great value anymore. Because professionalism uh, means some deep knowledge and nobody needs this deep knowledge because the world is changing. Uh, creativity, imagination in many, many areas of human activity are becoming much more important uh, for, for business development. And uh, if you're using crowdsourcing, if you're using creativity and imagination of different people, with different professional backgrounds, with different nationalities, with different mentality, you're increasing your chance to uh, find some genius solution of the most complicated issues and challenges. Uh, uh, so I think that crowd intelligence will be one of the two main driving forces in the future. The second driving force will be artificial intelligence, and a lot of people are speaking about artificial intelligence, but as human beings, I don't want Uh, to live in the world where artificial intelligence is the main uh, uh, driving power. I want crowd intelligence, human intelligence also to play a role in this new world. So I think it's, it, it was my, my, my last point in my presentation. Thank you very much for that. And I think there were very much echoes of, of what you were saying in the context of what Sherry was discussing. And I think there are some points that are really worth coming back to. Um, but first of all, can we go to Daniel and ask if you uh, You would take the microphone now, please. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I would like to talk about 
um, the impact of COVID on venture capital investing um, and also the you know developments you know of certain you know startup segments. So um, you know first topic you know how um, did the VC industry, especially here in Europe, you know deal with COVID. So when we moved into um, I would say February March you know last year, I think it was a uh, everyone was shocked. You know things you know grinded to a standstill. Um, and um, you know, investment activity um, you know basically stopped completely. Um, existing due diligence processes you know were put on hold, and everyone was wondering. I mean, how long this would persist? You know, um, and whether we would actually be able to invest again. You know, in the course of um, last year, and um, what really turned out to be the case is that um, you know the speed of things moving digital, also when it comes to uh, um, actually interacting with you know investee. You know, companies um, interacting with management teams, doing uh, due diligence processes. It was amazing how this um, actually uh, overnight, you know, switched. Right? I mean, from you know, mostly physical interaction between investors and startups to basically complete digital interaction. So I think by mid of the summer, we are, you know, we, we saw deals being done again. Um, also, um, in in many cases, you know, investors had not even met, you know, this, this startup management teams, you know, which was really unthinkable, you know, beforehand. And I think this is a trend, you know, that has been continuing. I mean, the, you know, the overall um, investment activity declined last year, of course, but it's um, it's a much still at a much higher level than everyone, you know, would have expected. And I think. Um, um, this has also led to um, increasing efficiency in deal making, right? So I feel that you know processes are really shorter now, right? Um, everything has moved digital, inter- you know, exchange of information, no travel activity um, needed. So actually, the average you know time of completing deals you know is declining, you know, I feel, and. Um, and also, I think for the you know for the you know also touching on what uh, Mika said in terms of um, you know crowdfunding, in terms of you know investors, um, you know also um, uh, non you know, or less qualified investors actually moving into this space, interacting with startups, you know um, signing up to digital you know investment platforms. So really, this new wave of actually accessing private markets, right after you know obviously the Robin Hoods, you know for public markets. I think the next big trend we are seeing is really you know, platforms that enable you know access to private market investments, you know, um, in the you know private debt, you know, venture capital, and you know, I feel this is also significantly accelerated, um, you know, due to COVID. Um, so this is really from a, a VC point of view, from um, you know a subsector point of view. So I, I told you before that we are investing in um, in health tech startups, and you know, especially the digital health segment, um, a development here. I would say has probably moved forward by around five years, right? I mean, within within twelve months. So, um, so you're looking at um, digital therapeutics business models, you know, ranging from you know chronic disease, um, you know, therapeutics to identification, early identification, you know, of Alzheimer's. Um, so basically, everything is is moving online, and the you know the the you know there's you know less and less need actually for patients to go physically to the hospitals, you know, for their treatment. And I think um, you know this uh, for us has also been a, a really striking development. And also, um, you know, the fact that a lot of pharma companies are actually also starting to embrace this, you know, actively work with these, you know, digital health, you know, business models to increase the efficacy of their drugs. Um, it was another trend that was really triggered by, you know, by COVID last year. You know, so despite all the, you know, negative developments, um, there's been some real, you know, disruptive, um, you know, developments in the venture space. Very good. Thank you very much. The really useful comments. I think um, there were some fascinating points made, but the, for me, the overriding message coming out is that perhaps the context in which entrepreneurship can be exercised has been changed during the period of the uh, COVID. Now, Sherry, I'd just like to pick up on, on a point you made, which might bring those points together, which have come from from all the other speakers. And that's that's the reason for the pace of or the difference in the, the speed with which businesses were established. You talked about a, a 10-year period for your first business, but then this period of rapid expansion um, in relation to the, the adaptation. And I just wondered if you reflected on what, what had caused that. What were the factors that made things different? So when I first started with the longest day, I, I went to um, Ecole Hotelier de Lausanne in Switzerland, and I 
had an idea to build a boutique hotel and they said, you could do something bigger than a boutique hotel. Come on. We used to work in tech because I used to have a tech background. And uh, being in tech, you're always advanced. You always see things, you know, well before anyone else does. Right. So I was used to innovating in the technology world. And um, so when I kind of came across hotels, it was, you know, and furniture, it was almost like working a bit like with the dinosaur industry you know and so i think the difference is that then i did all this market research for two years and i came up with this concept um so it's like i did all this market research and i came up with this concept but the concept was almost way too early for the market people were not buying furniture on the internet um weston was sort of selling their mattresses in hotels um so you needed to kind of you know, uh, understand that when I created The Longest Stay, I was the first company to bring an Italian brand on the internet and try to sell furniture. And when the market wasn't, was just buying fashion and they weren't even buying furniture and you were a luxury brand, you had a long ladder to climb before you were gonna be known. And if you didn't wanna take a, a large amount of investment, uh, you know, buy a venture capitalist or something like that, you were, uh, that would hopefully educate the market um, and even if, if it didn't, you would be without any equity at the end of that period and a lot of marketing burned and no one really understanding what you're doing. So I had to actually um, wait uh, for a larger player that was mass market to take huge amount of money and educate the market. And, and that was made.com did that. So I organically built my longest day business over a period of time with just taking angel investment. Kind of, you know, a bit like organically growing it, taking a 50K investor, 100K investor, 20K investor, and always keeping my valuation, which was good, but just kind of riding the wave. And I think that was the difference, is that I was way too early, but I kept riding the wave. I never changed my vision. I never said, I'm not going to do this. I said, there's going to be a time when the market will be ready, and I will be there. And I'm going to watch everyone else around me fall. And in fact, they did fall. May didn't fall, but there were other e-commerce luxury brands launching, closing, launching, closing. And I kept saying, well, actually, I'm going to be shoppable hotels. The e-commerce is just one side of it. You know, I'm going to win the big B2B contracts. I'm going to go ahead and furnish these projects. I'm going to have a profitable business and a scalable business. So I stuck it out. So it's been a painstaking, slow process. Um, you would think that I, I probably endured more than a lot of entrepreneurs in some cases because, you know, after two, three years, a lot of them will just say, oh, no, you know, but I knew that give me, you know, the right time in the market, I would be there. And I never did anything else. I just focus on the longest day the whole time. I have 27 angel investors. I have a new one joining this week. And now I have large investors that own hotels and are involved in the hotel business that will come in and help me now scale it. So, but it's been, I started in 2008 at EHL. I finished in 2010, 2010 to 2021. I've been on the longest day. And, and I also, during this process, I, I tragically lost my husband um, who died from a heart attack very young. So, and I still stayed and I still kept going and going and going and going and never ever said I would take another job or be in the board of another company. I just was completely dedicated. So, I think, you know, that that's that path. The sexy single dish was right place, right time now. It, and it worked magically, effortless. Yeah. Because the market crashed in terms of restaurants and, and going out and people were forced to be at home. And that market dynamic allowed people to, one, watch on social media a lot more, you know, engage with cooking a lot more because they had more free time to do so. The only places I could go to were butchers and fish fishmongers. I couldn't go out anywhere else, really. So I had unique content that, I, that was interesting to people because they had to go to the same places that I had to go to, right? So I was at the right place and the right time, and I just it just kind of all came together. Um, and, and that's why, you know, I think it, it will definitely be a TV series this year, and it will – 
it will be a really interesting series because it will talk about, you know, going back to basics, how to cook with natural ingredients, not being uh, complicated like I would say Nigella or someone is very, very simple, basic cooking, how to source a piece of meat from a butcher, what is the difference between cuttlefish and calamari and, and that kind of thing, and that's needed. But I just was at the right place at the right time, and that is why it's moved very fast. And that's not to say that if you have a good business but the market's not ready, you shouldn't do it. You just have to know it's going to be hard. It's going to take a long time. Don't burn through capital that's going to give you no real result. Trying to educate people, they're not going to get it for a long time. Just stay low. You know, I kept my burn rate, you know, at times 10K a month. And I just rode the wave. And I just said, the brand's great. The hotels will come in. Soon I'll be selling mattresses in the rooms. I will get there. I will get there. I will get there. And and now I also realize that with the show, if I'm in front of 180 million people, well, thank God I didn't take the millions and millions of investment because I've just built my brand through, you know, through an international TV platform. You know, that I don't need to waste all that money. And, and my share price will be affected by that because more people will know about the longest stay, right? It becomes becomes my you know, my my kind of default um mention on the show probably will always say, Well, you could buy that the longest day or we'll be the main sponsor. So so yes, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. So right time, right place, sexy single dish. Wasn't looking for it, wasn't searching for it, wasn't trying to come up with something. Accidental pregnancy just happened. The longest stay, painful IVF. But it was going is going to reward financially in a very big yeah. way. But I would probably have a fifteen year journey to say I've sold it for this yeah. amount. Um, it is not a, and, and I'm sorry, I know there's a lot of VCs that say, oh, if it hasn't taken off in three years, forget about it. it no, sometimes ideas just need to be parked and need to be nurtured. And, and you need to learn what the rest of the competitors are doing around you there that are starting and taking big com, uh, capital like on Crowdcube and burning through it and then saying, oh, we don't really have that much to show for all that $5 million we raised. Let's reinvent it. Let's tweak it. Let's try to get another round in. I, I, I don't do that. I have full control of my company. I own 67%. I have 28 shareholders, and I've been doing it for 10 years. That's great. And I will see an exit, but it's, you know, maybe three years around the corner now, my exit. Thank you very much. And I think what's really been useful is that the way in which many of the, 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 the issues that have been discussed by all of the panelists are sort of reflected in some of those experiences. And I, I just wondered, we've, we've got about eight minutes left. Um, We've, we've talked very much about the changes, therefore, in terms of systems of processes, the impact of technology on those. We've talked about the routes to getting to market. We've talked also in the presentations about, I'm, I'm really intrigued by Mikhail's idea about, about the position of experts and the expertise, and that's a fascinating uh, thing to reflect on. I'm also conscious in the, the discussion that has taken place in previous panels before this session. We've been talking about purpose. We've been talking about climate change. We've been talking about societal changes. And I just wondered whether in your, um, and this is a, a question to everyone, whether there are some fundamental changes that have come out in societal terms, which I think will um, really impact this uh, this burst of entrepreneurship, if you like, this entrepreneurial flood that we've been talking about going forward. And, and I, can I just open up, Shalanda, can I come to yourself first? Do, do you see any any major changes in society that will then be picked up by entrepreneurs and provide a, a new series of opportunities? Um, you want me to if Yes, you have, yes, just your, your ideas. Yeah, I'll go around every yeah. panelist, yes, and yeah. just get the right ideas. Yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> well, uh, the societal changes have been many. Actually, uh, this pandemic has hit, as I said, that one of the biggest uh, uh, changes that has occurred uh, is on the workforce. Uh, uh, a lot of people uh, have uh, been uh, out of jobs, uh, maybe the capacities which are being utilized. I come from manufacturing, so I can take that perspective and then uh, tell you that the capacities uh, have been uh, vacated uh, because we cannot work more than 50 percent uh, of the capacities uh, because uh, of uh, the social distancing and other norms. And therefore, uh, the layoffs, uh, the retrenchment, uh, and then the optimization of workforce and then the working in different shifts and things like that uh, come into being. And therefore, uh, the labor or the workforce has taken a lot of beating as such. 
therefore uh, the new uh, avenues uh, have opened uh, uh, for uh, people to look for uh, like i said in my earlier opening remarks also that uh, more than 25 to 30% of the workforce will have to look for new occupations because the existing occupations cannot uh, use them another uh, societal uh, change which has come about is that people have uh, started uh, looking at uh, healthcare as uh, one of the uncertainties uh, which is going to be there forever like uh, mikhail said that uh, we don't know whether this is going to be the first and the last pandemic it could be a series of pandemics coming uh, because of uh, different things so healthcare uncertainty is uh, going to be something which is going to be uh, uh, the always on the agenda as far as the society is concerned and then um, the work strategies as i have been saying it uh, that working from home is the biggest change uh, I mean, everyone is sitting at home uh, and then trying to work it out uh, so if you have sufficient space fine everyone gets accommodated if all of the family members are working but then if not then is going to be a, a, a sort of an adjustment or it's going to be a challenge uh, for a family to survive uh, working from home and then it creates a lot of other psychological effects uh, when you are not just going out and day in and day out you have been sitting at home and then trying to work it out there have been um, uh, issues uh, with the individuals emotional as well as physical uh, on uh, this kind of uh, work styles uh, as far as i look at it from my point of view i'm used to traveling at least 100 to 110 days in a year uh, but then last 12 months uh, i've been stuck at home so uh, this is an issue which has been uh, bothering me as a person uh, as such because i'm used to meeting people i'm used to interacting personally and uh, that style has totally changed to interacting digitally and uh, it does not really convey uh, the feeling of uh, a physical meeting uh, digitally although it is very fast it has increased the reach and uh, things like that but then these are a couple of issues which have affected us as an individual and in society yeah. i think that's useful that picks up some of the points daniel was making daniel mikhail i wonder if you would like to pick up any points that uh they wish to reflect on uh well uh, i think that it will be mo- a lot of changes in uh, human society maybe very briefly i will tell about one i think it will be a kind of division between urban areas and rural areas because the pandemic shows that it is very bad to live in cities because it's very big risk uh, 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 to be infected, but it's also very bad to live in villages because you don't have access to hospitals or entertainment or whatever. So in the future, it will be something in between, maybe syllages between villages and cities. So it will be one of possible changes in human society in the next, say, 10 or 20 years. But it will be a lot of challenges. And if you quite a lot of time to analyze and discuss. Okay, it. thank you. And lots of opportunities around the lovely concept of the silage. It's uh so yeah, Daniel, I wonder if you'd like to uh to Yeah, maybe just one point um you know also um uh, related uh, to what um you know um Michelle Andrew was saying, you know about uh, people staying having to stay at home uh, really the mental you know health issues uh, arising from that. So I think um over the last months, you know, mental health um you know um a state is um as really you know become um a, a core uh, a talking point right so um you know people are much more aware of you know mental health issues not just during covid but also actually post covid i think there are projections that uh, there will be you know especially you know among young people uh, significant mental health issues in in years to come and um and we are seeing um also within the you know health tech space an acceleration of um you know business models and solutions you know raise you know ranging from you know medical devices like such as neurostimulation um you know to um you know also more holistic, holistic approaches which uh, combine uh, psychotherapy with new digital therapeutic solutions and drugs to achieve you know much more um you know positive you know patient outcomes so um so this is a key trend and a key change i'm seeing i mean mental health didn't used to be a big topic uh, but now it has really has become yeah and sherry i wondered if you you have any final reflections in the last minute so well i just think you know everything happens for a reason and we can you know all take something positive out of covid if you choose to take something this, whether you're it's about re reinventing your personal image whether it's about innovation in your own business whether it's the way you use your capital or the way you treat your employees 
I think there's always something positive to come out of something like a pandemic. You just have to find the silver lining out there, and there is always one. Thank you very much. And I think we'll, we're coming to the end. Could I finish on that very positive note? Could I thank all the panelists for their contribution, the fascinating debate? I think that that concept of change, what has changed, the indicators that we've given of the um, of what it will have got to look forward to is very, very useful going forward. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank, you thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you. I wonder if we're still being recorded. <laughs> I think there will be. Nice. Nice to meet it's everyone. It's been great to meet you all. It's, um, I'm sure you'll meet you again at, um, at another session. Yeah. It's, uh, well, I hope yeah. you're all staying safe. Yeah. Me well. it's, um, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the okay. afternoon. Okay. Um, Good morning. Great. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. bye.